<laughs> okay, um, this you can see a question like this too in the free response. So these are easier questions, but since we only have two chapters, you can see some of these easier questions. Oh, good to figure out. Maybe I just don't know what you're asking for. Oh, yeah, we didn't talk about current density. Yeah, so don't, don't worry about that. Yeah. 10 would be decibelians, right? 10? What? Yeah, 10 milliohms. So that's equal to 0 0.01 ohms. Yeah, make sure you all know your metric prefixes because milli actually did come up on the, on the exam, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so remember, uh, milli is 10 to the minus 3, micro is 10 to the minus 6. I think those are the only ones that really come up. If you ever in doubt, convert everything to SI units. All right, we do this, like a lot of times I won't do that because the units cancel out. But if you're ever doubt, in doubt, make sure you convert them. Okay? You all okay on this problem? You would have to uh, find the area to get the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I want to know the current in the wire, uh, I is equal to V over R. See, it looks like V is given 34 volts over 0.01 ohms. That's what, three, four, zero, zero amps. Goodness, really? That's what I thought the question was. That's a lot of amps. That's a lot of amps, yeah. Uh, and then we're going to skip the current density. It's not terribly difficult, we just didn't define it. So, um, And then what is the resistivity of the wire material? Well, we know the resistance is 0.01 ohms. And we know that's equal to rho L over A. So we want to solve this for rho is going to be 0.01 A over L. The area is pi R squared. It's going to be pi times 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. I got that radius from the 5 millimeters, but that's the diameter, so you have to have it, and then you have to convert it to meters. So it's not pi over 4 D squared? You could do it that way, that's fine. Pi over 4 D squared. But most people know pi r squared for area. You hear what he's saying? It's also area is also equal to pi times d over two squared or pi over four d squared. If you want to do it that way, that's fine. Uh, pi r squared over the length, which was three meters, and then that'll give you. No, no equal there, that's times. And then that'll give you resistivity, whatever that is. Probably see a question, something like that, something where you have to calculate the resistivity. I might have you find the unknown metal like we did in class. Uh, it'll probably be paired with, you know, Ohm's law. Also in that, you could see a power calculation, determining the power. The 2.5 is half of 5. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's the radius. So the radius equals the diameter divided by 2. Yeah. All right. What else? You want to do another circuit while we're... Capacitor. You'll definitely have a capacitor circuit. There's a circuit on this one. Let's do that one, huh? Woo! That's okay? Similar one to the one we've already done. Are they all similar? No, yeah, they're all similar. Really? They're all a little bit different, though, right? This is actually an exact loop that we've already done. Oh, really? Well, let's let's find a slightly different one. The numbers may be different. The numbers may be different, but they go to uh, structure. Two thousand seven. Oh yeah, this one's a little different, huh? Okay, this one's a little different. I'll try to make it different for Friday. Like different from ones that we've done. No. But similar difficulty. Be the one with guns, let's change the question. That would be easier for me. Yeah, you don't mind. Cut face, cut face. Yeah, cut face. Just change the numbers. No, that's not challenging enough for you. All right, so. Um, all right, look, I want to follow my battery and I come up here. And then I notice that I have one, two, three branches that all branch off. So let's redraw this. Let 
one, two, three branches. And then I'll follow each of those three branches. Now, when they go through, they all come back to these points. That's going to signify the end of a parallel branch. Y'all see how that is? See, there's no, if I come back here, it's like I can take all these points along this line and I can collapse them all down to a single point because there are no capacitors along that line. Well, let's just first go and we'll start drawing these out. So here I have C4. C4. Yeah, that's this capacitor oh, right here. Pretty that's pretty what? Explosive. What does that mean? C4. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I have C5. And then I have C6. And then over here I have C2. C4 comes down, and then I get this wire that comes back into C4. So these are all going to signify the end of a parallel branch. Would C6 be C3? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. C3. Huh? Right, right, right. And then I have a new parallel branch. It looks like this. This is going to be C1, and then this is C6. All right, and then that's that's my new circuit. All right, let's put in some numbers here. So that first one was five microfarads. This is three and three. C2 is 5, C6 was uh, 2, I'll give you the numbers on the circuit when I do it, and then C1 is 2 microfarads. The first thing you want to do is just find the equivalent capacitance. You want to address C5 and C3 first, okay, so C5 and C3, to find the equivalent of that it's going to be 1 over 1 over 3 plus 1 over 3. Oh, the numbers aren't even, so uh, that's 1 over 2 thirds, which is 3 halves. So I can combine those to make a 3 halves capacitor. And then I can address this whole branch, this top branch right here, which is going to be 5 plus 3 halves plus 5. So 23 halves or say 11.5 if you want. These are all in microfarads. All right, and then I'm going to address this one down here on the bottom, C1 and C6. And I'm, I'll redraw the circuit here in just a second. That's going to be 2 plus 2 is 4. All right. Um, I wouldn't do it this way, honestly. I would... Uh, what would make it easier? Can I change the numbers on these a little bit to make it easier? Let me show you. So instead of 3 and 3 here, I would do 2 and 2. Yeah, which would be 1. And then I would give you 1. And I would make this a 2 as well. You okay with that? I don't care, dude. All right, so I'll make some changes here. That's going to be 1 over 2, 2, which makes this 1. And then this becomes, I'm sorry, 5. This is 1. This is 2. That makes this 8. All right. So now my new circuit looks like this. I have my battery. I have an 8 microfarad capacitor and I have a 4 microfarad capacitor. And I'm going to make this 12 volts instead. Alright, this is 8 microfarads, 4 microfarads. What's the voltage on the 8 microfarad? There are big capacitors, have small voltages. So what's the voltage on the 8, 8 microfarad? What is it? It is four. Remember those two numbers have to add up. What's the, what's the oh, 
In just a second, I'll show you. Oh. I'll show you how to get that other way. So, uh, looking at that circuit in the bottom right, I can find the equivalent capacitance is 1 over 1 over 8 plus 1 over 4. That's going to be 1 over 1 8 plus 2 8, so it's 3 8, so it's 8 thirds microfarads. So the equivalent capacitance is 8 thirds. All right? And then my equivalent charge would be 12 times 8 thirds. That's CV. That's 8 thirds microfarads times 12 volts. That's what? 32 microcoulombs. And then V1 which is the voltage across C1, which is this capacitor right here, which is going to be the same as the voltage on this capacitor. It's going to be 8 volts. Now let me show you, uh, if your numbers don't work out evenly, or if you just don't understand how I got that 4 volts, 8 volts thing, you could come back up here and say, well, my equivalent, I'm sorry, this should be microcoulombs, no, that's right, microfarads. My equivalent charge is 32 microcoulombs. So that means that I have 32 microcoulombs on this capacitor and 32 microcoulombs on this capacitor. So now I know the charge and the capacitance. And so the voltage is Q over C. So here, if I know Q right here and I know C, I can just say 32 divided by 8. And that gives me 4. I can say 32 divided by 4, and that gives me 8. But I find it a lot easier just to think about how the voltages are distributed along the capacitors. Are y'all able to do that in your head? I do it, but I can still do it. It's a check. Yeah, that's fine. So if you know the charge and you know the capacitor, you can find the voltage. Really just if you check yourself by adding those two voltages together, they should be right. And they should add, add up. 4 volts and 8 volts should have equal 12 volts. And the 4 volts is across the bigger capacitor, and the 8 volts is across the smaller capacitor. The voltages are different by a factor of 2 because the capacitances are different by a factor of 2. And so they're distributed in that way. Yeah? Okay, so then Q1. Uh, we've already found Q1 is 32 microcoulombs. Wait, no, it's not. Is it? Uh, V1 was 8 volts. And we have 2 microcoulombs, so it's 16. Excuse me, 2 microfarads. So it's 16 microcoulombs. Uh, V2, that is going to be the voltage across here. What is that? You should be able to tell me what the information we have. V2, that is the voltage across this capacitor right here. It's going to be 4 volts, right. Let me show you why. Because we have 4 volts across this capacitor, this 8 microfarad capacitor, which is the equivalent of these 3 capacitors. So that means I have 4 volts here, 4 volts across these 2 capacitors, and 4 volts there. Two volts, right. I would have two volts here and two volts here. Only because those two capacitors are identical, and so they split that voltage evenly. If one were three and another were one, then they would be the same thing. Like the other one, right? Yeah, if there were three and one. And the problem is one would be three well, and then. One would be one and one would be three volts, yeah. So the three microcoulomb capacitor, microfarad capacitor would have one volt. They would, and the other would have one volt, three volts, excuse me. If they were different, it would just, it would just be trying to find, it would divide like that and find the, the microcoulombs, and then take that and multiply that and find the voltage. If you want to right, so here, if these two capacitors were different, you would find the equivalent capacitance of the two, and then find the charge on that equivalent capacitance, and then 
say, well, if they both have the same charge, and since you know then the charge and the capacitance, then you would find the voltage. But you know, in your circuit, you're going to see some really common numbers that you're seeing. Like you'll probably see a 3 and a 6, and a four, a couple of 4s together. You'll see two identical capacitors. You'll see this sort of splitting of the voltages in this way. So go through and look at those numbers. You know, we have a 3 and a 6 in series, a, a 4 and a 4 in series, a 2 and a 2 in series. And those all add up to give you good um, numbers. Do you have any ones that we would have to do that thing that you did last time? Or it was not an even number in between the two voltages to work that out. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I'm thinking. Okay. Do y'all want something like that? No, we don't. No, probably not. No, we'll say no. I'd like for y'all to just be able to look at it. I mean, if you want to go back and check it, that's a good way to check your answer. Oh, the way I'm, Rob was talking I'm about. saying, like, that thing that you did to make it work, mm -hmm. to split the voltage in between the two because mm -hmm. they were not even numbers. Right. Wasn't that a movie? That thing you did? No, that thing you do or something? Was that a movie? Yeah. It was about capacitor. Wasn't it about capacitor? Where's the ears, though? Oh, it's a band. Yeah. It's the 90s. I don't know. Oh, that's probably what happened. Alright. Alright. Is that okay? Anything else? For this test? Well, not for this. I mean, I think for this. Yeah, I hope it's easier. I hope so. All right. It is. It would make me really happy if it was easy. Like if everyone really ate 100%. Because then my job's easy. Grading is really easy. Um, would you say that we would have to start from page 69? Can I see your book? good on the test? I'm coming at 7.15. I, I think it's probably good for you to get here at 7.15. I know that's kind of hard. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, the doors are open at 7 usually. If they're not all. Not very often. Especially, <laughs> it happens especially the same one. Yeah, they, they prefer to, to open them late on rainy days to make all the students stay out in the rain. But I'll prop open, if they're not here, I'll prop open the middle doors down here. Okay. The newspaper or whatever. The chapter 4 that was started Monday night was not No, no chapter 4. Um, are y'all aware, by the way, like if, if I were to draw this circuit, I'm drawing it with the resistors, but I could draw it with capacitors too. Sure. Are you aware? <laughs> of what what kind of circuit is that? Parallel. It's just a parallel circuit, right? But huh, all three are in parallel. Are right, you can imagine in your mind the wires can be as long as you want. You can imagine in your mind taking this wire and just and then it's the same. I just wanted to show you that because, just in case. Yeah, so these are the, these are the same circuits. Are you all aware of that? But you are now, right? Those are the same circuits. Um, and so, and they could be capacitors too. <laughs> wink, wink. Okay, but in circuit diagrams, often they're drawn like that, where the, I think it's a safe space or whatever, but they're often drawn like that. I just want to be cool. I think it's for safe space. It says it's easier to, to label them. Yeah. All right.
Yeah, you might want to write that down. Okay, uh, let's look at this circuit. So this is chapter four. Um, by the way, what direction would the current flow in this circuit? Uh, what direction would the conventional current flow? Be clockwise or counterclockwise? Be clockwise, right? So it comes off the positive terminal and it flows to the to the negative terminal. Where do we leave off? Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering. We didn't. We haven't done resistors in series parallel yet. That's like no. All right. So in this circuit, um, every time we go across a device, be it a battery or a resistor, we're going to see either a, a drop or a rise in potential. Generally, when you go across resistors, you see what a, a rise or a drop. You see a drop usually. And when you go across a battery, usually you see a rise in potential. So if we imagine the energy of the batteries, of the electrons, I'll write the energy as U. Sometimes we write it as U. Uh, the energy here will increase for the electrons. And over here, the energy will decrease. And you'll get uh, your amount of increases will equal the amount of decreases. I don't know if we've written this yet, but the loop rule. I'll write this again. Have we seen the loop rule yet? Yeah, I know, but I'm just going to show you here. Okay, well, the loop rule is going to be sort of our second big rule when we're dealing with circuits. Uh, and it just says that the sum of all these energies is equal to zero. So, in particular, you know, energies are similar to voltages because voltage is just energy per charge. So, the loop rule says that the sum of the potentials is equal to zero across a loop. And so the amount of energy that I gain here will equal the amount of energy lost here and here. So when the electron comes back to this point, how much energy does it have? It has zero energy. And then it picks up energy in the battery, and then it goes through and it spins it all at those various places, at the resistors, doing whatever it is that, that they do. Buying things. Buying things, making friends, watching movies. All right, so... The battery, generally, the battery is where the uh, electrons gain energy. Though we'll see an example of where that's not the case later. Where's, where's an example where the electrons don't gain energy in a battery? I think we said this before. When you're charging a battery, in that case, the electrons are giving energy to the battery. We'll see that later. Uh, lose energy in the resistors. And this energy, you know, it goes to whatever. Uh, it goes to thermal energy, mechanical energy, whatever your, your, your circuit's designed to do. All right. And so we have a drop or rise in potential, that energy per unit charge that we listed on the circuit. And we can calculate this. Uh, so for the, the EMF, it's going to be plus E, which is just, as I said, a fancy way of saying the voltage. And for these, it's going to be minus I times R and minus I times big R. So we can use Ohm's law to calculate those drops and changes in potential. Right? And then, as I said, when you go around the entire circuit, the change in the potential is zero. So that your, your uh, electron, when it goes through an entire circuit, it'll have the same energy uh, when it returns back to its original spot. And as I said, this is the loop rule. We'll use it a lot. If you're an electrical engineer, if you're going into electrical engineering, I don't think there is anybody. Is there electrical? Are you? Yeah, so you'll use this a lot in some of your circuits classes. The loop rule comes up a lot. And the loop rule just says that the sum of the potentials across a loop, a closed loop, is equal to zero. Doesn't matter how complex the circuit is. You can take any one closed loop within that circuit, and that will be true, that the sum of the potentials in that loop will be zero. Even if it's like one little bitty piece embedded within a huge circuit diagram, this will still hold true. Um, oh, so here the EMF. If I do the sum of the potentials, that's going to be E minus IR minus I big R. That will all equal to zero. 
So we can solve for the EMF, which is just going to be the drop in potential across the internal resistance plus the drop in potential across the resistor. And we get the EMF. All right, let's look at uh, resistors in series. Can I go down from here? All right, so these are resistors in series. We'll look at just some simple, simple applications of this and then do some more complicated circuits. All right, so we'll have a series of rules. Um, first of all, from the loop rule that we just said previously, I can say that delta V <coughs> minus IR1 <coughs> minus IR2, that has to equal zero. This is just from the loop rule. Right, and then I can say that delta V is equal to IR1 plus IR2. Right. Now the thing about resistors in series if, is if I have a certain current flowing through this wire at a particular point, and remember what is the definition of current? Charge. Right, so the amount of charge that passes a point in a given time. So uh, if I have a certain amount of charge that passes this point in a given time, then that I'm going to have that same amount at any other point within this series circuit. So this is going to be one of our first rules, and that is that resistors in series have the same what? Current. So resistors in series have the same current. Uh, so I can say here that I is equal to I. I can factor that out, and I get I times R1 plus R2 equals delta V. Now this expression right here is going to be our equivalent resistance. Okay. Because of this fact that resistors in series have the same current, uh, I can factor that I out and then I get an expression for my equivalent resistance, REQ. So for resistors in series, the equivalent resistance is just R1 plus R2 plus you know, however many resistors you have. And then this should be obvious to you, but uh, it'll come up with resistors in parallel a little bit differently. But the equivalent resistance is always bigger than any individual resistor. Right? That's obvious. As you're adding them up, like if R1 is 0.5 and R2 is 1, then my equivalent is 1.5. And that's bigger than any individual resistor. All right? For lack of stating the obvious. But with resistors in parallel, the equivalent resistance is actually going to be smaller than any of the individual resistors. So that's why I listed here. All right, so we have a couple rules. I'm starting to have them. The resistors in series have the same current. The equivalent resistance for resistors in series is R1 plus R2 plus dot, dot, dot. And then I can also write the loop rule, which just says that V is equal to V1 plus V2 plus however many voltages I have in series. So I think those are, oh, and then uh, one other rule, resistors in series, oh, I already have that. Yeah, that's it. So uh, those are the three rules regarding resistors in series. VIR. Oh, VIR. Thank you. I knew I was missing one. Yeah, so I also have Ohm's law. This is always going to apply to any resistor. Just like the one charge for the other right, so these are very similar to what we had for capacitors. Remember, we had those rules for capacitors. Like, for example, we had Q with CV. We had capacitors in series have the same charge. We had the equivalent resistance, equivalent capacitance. Though this looks like capacitors in parallel, right? So be careful. They're switched for capacitors and resistors. And then this last expression was also true for capacitors in series. So very, very similar to capacitors, but also just a little bit different. Mainly, I guess, with the equivalent. So those are our four rules. Yeah, just is it, what you say, just enough to mess. Right, that's that's the goal is to mess you up. Right. Well, nobody made it. It's just the way the world is. Okay, so. All right. Let's um. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's see. I think I've already written these, but resistors in series have the same charge. You can write them again if you like, or, or not same charge, same current. 
uh, the voltage and the resistors in series adds to equal the total change in potential. I'll recap those in a little while when we start doing combination circuits, but we have those four rules. Okay, so let's look at these light bulbs hooked up in series. First of all, if I just remove R2, that is I take R2 out, like I unscrew the light bulb, what's going to happen to the circuit? Right, the whole thing will go out. Y'all remember those Christmas lights where they were all in series? But they don't make them like that anymore. So, But if you had one resistor that, or if you had one light bulb that burnt out, that means that you get a break in this wire, and then it wouldn't work anymore. Right? The whole strand would go out. Now these days, actually, uh, the strands are hooked up usually in parallel, and so you don't have that issue. That's why if you look at a strand of lights, you have multiple strands of wires. They're all twisted up together. I think you have to kind of get both ways parallel in series, because sometimes when you take one out, it goes to the section room, and then the other one continues. They do have, it depends on the lights that you're using. You're right. Sometimes they are hooked up in series, but most of them have light bulbs there's all sorts, all sorts of stuff on the internet. You don't need to write this down, I don't care. They have light bulbs that are sort of like this. They have the filament, which is where the light comes from. And then what? You're right, yeah. So they have another little thing here, so that if this happens to blow out, the current will still have a place to go. Is that what you were saying, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The little what? <laughs> okay, so if we move R2 from a series circuit, the whole circuit goes out. Alright, but what happens if we replace R2 with a wire? So let's say that we have two identical bulbs here, and we take R2 out, and we just replace it with a wire. What happens to the uh, the brightness of R1, we'll do this as a clicker question. Does the brightness increase? Does the brightness decrease? Or to C, does the brightness just stay the same? If I replace R2 with a wire, the brightness of R1 go up, down, or, or stay the same? It's like we're picking up another class. Everybody clicked in? I'll stop at 50. 3, 6, 10. Oh, no, I guess that's everybody. Very good. All right, uh, if we take out R2, and that's just going to leave one uh, uh, light bulb here. So let's say we had 12 volts. When you had them both together, you'd have 6 volts and 6 volts. But when you take one of them out, you get 12 volts all across that one. So you get more energy going through that one light bulb. And so uh, R1 will brighten. Can I go down from here? Let's do a simple circuit. So here I have uh, 10 volts with 1, 2, and 2 ohms. I want to know the equivalent resistance. Uh, gosh, how do you find it when they're in series? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. You just add them up. So it's 1 plus 2 plus 2. All right. Uh, and then if I want to know the current through the resistor R1, I would find the total current. So the total current. That is the current flowing through this part of the circuit is going to equal V over R equivalent. And so that's going to be 10 over 5, which is 2 amps. And so that's going to be the current also through I, I1, 2 amps through R1. 
So this is similar to what we do with capacitors. Remember, capacitors in the series had all the same charge, so we found the equivalent charge. So that's something similar that we're doing here. We're finding the total current, and then that current is going to be through all the resistors. All right? And then once we know the current and the resistance, we can find the potential. So I know that I have two amps here, two amps here, and two amps here. So I can find the potential across each of those. So it looks like I'm going to have two, four, and four. Resistors all have the same current. And this is going to be I times R1, I times R2. Now, in this last one, you could say I times R3, and that's probably easier at this junction, which is 2 amps times 2 ohms, would be 4 volts. Or we could say, look, I have 6 volts here, and I know that I have to have a total of 10 volts, so I could say 10 volts minus 6 volts, which would give me 4 volts. All right, so if you ever know any all but one of the voltages, you can find the third one fairly easily. So I want you to notice here, remember with capacitors, if you had a bigger capacitance, then you had a smaller voltage. That's not true here. If you have a bigger resistance, you have a bigger voltage. All right, so notice here, I have a bigger resistance here by a factor of two compared to here, and so I have twice the voltage. So the uh, voltage and resistance are directly proportional, whereas the charge and the voltage were inversely proportional for capacitors. So if you're trying to work out where you're just doing those distributions of voltages, you need to remember that, that a bigger resistor has a bigger voltage given the same current. Let me just write that in words. Bigger resistors have bigger voltage. Bigger resistors have more fun, right? Isn't that from a movie, too? Something has more fun. What has more fun? I don't know. Girls. No, that was like a Madonna song, I think, wasn't it? Girls just want to have fun or something. I'm not sure that's true. Huh? Oh, is that Thank you, Rob. You're like our window into the 80s. <laughs> All right. Okay, so recall that the change in potential for resistors In series as to equal the total voltage. So if you know the voltage across the first two resistors, you can find V3 like this. You just say, we did this already, but 10 volts minus 4 volts plus 2 volts is equal to 4 volts. Okay. That should be pretty simple. Probably not going to see questions that simple on the test, but uh, unless it's like multiple. Well, you might see some multiple choice. Let's try this one. Uh, what is the potential across the 8 ohm resistor here? Find your equivalent resistance, find your current, and then find your potentials.
All right, I'll stop about 1.35. Just a few more seconds. Still missing a couple folks up here. 1.35. Okay, very good. B is the right answer. Oh, that's not what I wanted. All right, find the equivalent, which is going to be 4 plus 8 plus 12. So the equivalent would equal 24 ohms. And then I can find my total current. That's the current here. It's going to be uh, V over R. That's 12 over 24, which is 0.5 amps. So each of these has 0.5 amps. So I can find the voltage in each. V is I times R. So I'm going to have two volts here. I will have four volts here. And I have six volts here. Notice two plus four plus six all adds up equal 12. So it's a good check for you. So B is the right answer. And so we'll see these type things embedded in more complicated circuits, combination circuits, which some of you have done in my lab, a simple combination circuit. Uh, let's move on. Y'all okay with this? All right. Now for resistors in parallel, we'll have similar rules. Uh, just a few more minutes. Um, these are going to be really similar to those for capacitors. The potential difference across each resistor is what? How do you think they compare? Right, they're in parallel. So they're like independent circuits all attached to the same power supply. So the potential difference across each resistor uh, is the same. That is that V is equal to V1, is equal to V2, is equal to however many uh, resistors you have where your circuit would look like this. This is V, V1, V2, and then on and on, however many resistors you have. And then also, the junction rule, which we've already given you, the current entering the junction must equal um, the total current leaving the junction. JXN is junction. This is the junction. So, for example, if I have 12 amps of current flowing into a junction, I have 10 amps here. What's my current going to be here? Off 2 amps, right? That's conservation of charge. You can't destroy charge. So if you have uh, currents flowing in, you have to have the same current flowing out. And even if you have a really complicated circuit, the junction rule is always going to apply at any junction. Anytime you have two or more parts coming in together, or three or more parts, I guess, coming in together, the junction rule will always apply. Right, so it allows you to, to just pick out little parts of a much, much more complicated circuit. Uh, so here, I would equal I1 plus I2. That is the junction rule. Right, to find the equivalent resistance for resistors in parallel, it's going to look like this. 1 over 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3 plus however many resistors you have. So remember, this is like capacitors in series. So that's one of our rules. So what happens to the equivalent resistance when you add resistors? Let's try this as a question. We'll make this our last little bit. Hmm? Right, yeah, I'm sorry. When you add resistors in parallel. Is it going to increase, decrease, or stay the same? I said this a little earlier. That's why I don't answer. You can see it mathematically. If you just plug in numbers, you'll see that it happens. I'll explain it to you. 
conceptually. Just a few more seconds. B is right. If you just look at it mathematically, let's say I have two resistors, a three and a three, two three ohm resistors in parallel. That's going to be one over one over three plus one over three. That's going to be one over two thirds, which is three halves. But if I add a third resistor, that is going to equal one. So see, by adding a resistor, I've actually dropped the resistance. Or you can think about it too. We're almost out of time, but if I have resistors in parallel like this, if I imagine an electron that is traveling along here and it comes to this point, it has three places it can go. You can go here, here, or here. And so it sees a certain amount of, a certain amount of resistance. But if I have another resistor, then it has four places it can go. And so its net resistance is going to be less because it has another option to take. It doesn't matter if you add a really big resistor, uh, it's still going to decrease the resistance. But if you add a really big resistor, it's going to decrease the resistance by less. So let me fill in these lines right quick. The equivalent resistance is always smaller than the smallest resistor. And we'll stop there. All right. We'll see that again in the concept test. We'll explore that a little bit more. You have a great day. I'll see you at hopefully seven.